Like if any other politician was out there doing a sing along with people who are in prison yeah. Yeah. for Law attacking cops. Yeah. Back the blue. I, I, it would be yes. Yeah, back the blue. That's the real law and order yeah. candidate. Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. It is Friday, and we are back with Tim Miller. Tim, how have you been? Charlie, it's been too long, man. Um, you know, we have so Stuff much has to, to cover. <laughs> Stuff has happened. You had COVID in the house. You know, yeah. we missed you. That You could have used a purple drink. I promised you. Yeah, in New Orleans, I missed you, you could have used Orleans. a purple drink. So do it a, do it a you know, a rain check, a, pur yeah, a you, purple you, rain you, check. Well, you think about it, it's been like, you know, a couple of weeks, all the things that have happened. We have a new speaker. Uh, we have a new, we have a couple of new wars. We have a new wars. slap fight going on in, in Congress. Uh, we can talk about all of that. I, I don't even, and I, I want you to explain some things to me. I want you to explain Ken Buck to me. I want to talk mm. about the Nikki Haley surge. I, I, I want to talk about um, you and Steve Schmidt and this whole Dean Phillips My campaign. Cow. Are you up for that? We're going to, we're going to do that. Yeah, let's do um, it all. But but there's every once in a while. Oh, and Tommy Tuberville. And whether you agree mm. with me or not, that Tommy Tuberville is the Senate's dumbest member. I understand that's a controversial position because competitive so category. Yeah. But you know, it was it was interesting watching the other night, where finally after nine months, the other Republicans called bull on him for holding up all of those promotions for no particular really? substantive reason. And it was not just the substance, it was also the tone. They were exasperated and disgusted with the guy. And it's like, they've been holding it in, right? That, that yeah. you know, they, they know how stupid Tommy Tuberville is, but also how reckless and dangerous and demagogic he is. And finally, it just, just poured out of them, which was good. It reminded Late, me of uh, how pissed the House, the kind of closet normals, uh, House Republicans were at Matt Gates. Yeah, same thing happened right during the McCarthy thing, where yeah. Garrett Graves from up here in Baton Rouge is up, you yeah. know, is that IQ is the establishment guy that went along with Trump, yeah. and he's up there going, "Mark Gates is the worst. He's the worst person. He's a grifter." And it's just like all these guys just have had to had to push it down for like seven years now, right? They can't say it about Trump. They've been they sucking it down like, for a very long time whisper. now. Right. <laughs> they can whisper it in the Capitol Hill club basement. They can't say it, but. They, I, finally, when when they let it out, you know, it's like the hot steam popping out of their ears, and uh, it is, uh, it, you know, they can Matt Gates and Tommy Tuberville, I guess, are are safe spaces. They feel like they can express their real feelings in a way that it won't cost them a primary, and so you get to see the true face of of what these guys think about the monster that they have created and enabled the past decade. Yeah, again and again and again, you know, yes. they create the monster of Marjorie Taylor Greene and they are amazed that she's turned on them. Or you've gone along with Tommy Tuberville and you realize, hey, there's actual consequences to attacking mm. the military. It, it was it was a little bit, look, the word ironic is overused, yeah. but I'll use it anyway here, that that they were willing to go along with Tommy Tuberville um, kneecapping the U.S. military up until the, the moment where the commandant of the Marine Corps has a heart attack because they're making him do two jobs. And there's a war in the Middle East where obviously U.S. military is going to be you know affected in some way. So it actually took a, a war and the heart attack from the top Marine for people to say, hey, maybe this Tommy Tuberville holiday hmm. from reality is not a good idea. Yeah, I mean, you would have thought on the merits, I, you know, the, at least the vestigial neocons, right? The vestigial strong national security types, the Tom Cottons but, and Lindsay's. And fi finally, they broke with Dan Sullivan, I guess, took the lead out of Alaska. Uh, I, I will say that I hope, I'm hoping that the Democrats... You know, use this to play hardball on this. I've seen the last couple of weeks. I feel like the not? Democrats have, are, are are whipping out. Uh, they went down on the George Santos thing. Several of them went along with this. I know we can talk about the Mike Johnson Israel funding tied to IRS gambit, yeah. and like even a couple of them went along with that. Yeah, I, I would love to see a little more hardball out of them, and hopefully this could be an example. I mean, the Republicans, Dan Sullivan and Lindsey Graham, just gave them free ad material for next fall. Oh, I, it's, it's Republicans on the Senate floor that are saying. Our party is hamper is hampering military readiness. Oh yeah, I, no, it was Dan, a, Dan Sullivan material. Oh yeah. yeah, I mean when he was talking about how the 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 gen the Chinese generals and admirals must be you know pinching themselves. How could they possibly be right. so lucky? Uh, lucky. What a great gift to, to Xi and to Vladimir Putin. This is coming from Republican senators on the floor talking about another Republican senator. So 
Okay, so it's like that's kind of just, a deal that, like, just really quick, these swing voters, like in Georgia, right? Who are the people yes. we're talking about? The suburban, de- white, college educated dads, right? Like, these are national security types, want a strong military, the Brian Kemp, uh, Raphael Warnock voter, right? Like, the, the, that, that demo that's going to be yeah, so key in yeah. 2024, this is really uh, effective grist, I would think, for, for motivating that. Uh, okay, so audience. there's so much we have to talk about. I mean, I'm going I'm to double back and talk about Congress, and you know, yeah. I want you to explain a lot of this stuff to me. But this is one of those moments where I go, okay, we can, we have been talking about Donald Trump for so long that there comes a mm. point where you go, can we talk about anything other than Donald Trump? I mean, like you and I both feel this way, right? I mean, you just get, you kind of get numbed, you kind of get bored by it. And yeah. it's like, you know, I literally this... quit reading a book last week because Donald Trump was a character, like turned out to be a character. And I was like, nope, mm. can't do it. Just yeah, going in no. the trash. Yeah. I need a well, break. Well, because you were reading guy. it for le- for leisure time, yeah. right? And it's like, <laughs> it's like right. suddenly this other world comes in, you yes. know, it's, well, yeah. Um, I guess I'm going to do that a little bit because Donald Trump uh, went down to Houston, Texas uh, to have a rally and he did something that he's done before. And I just think it's worth paying attention to what he's actually saying, because this is not the first time that he has played the January 6th prisoner anthem or that he has praised the insurrectionists. This is not the first time. In fact, as I wrote in Morning Shots, this is not a gaffe. This has become a foundational theme of his reelection campaign. This is a guy that started his his reelection campaign in Waco, Texas. We can get to that in a moment because there's a great quote from Steve Bannon about all this. But I want you to listen to listen to this. This is um, Donald Trump comes out, uh, you know, comes out on the stage and they start playing this. It goes, I mean, you have to know the, these are the the January sixth guys, right? Those are the prisoners. Well, They're singing it over a phone, much. I guess. And you know what that was? That was, I call them the J6 hostages. Uh, not prisoners. Oh I call my them God. the hostages. What's happened? And it's a shame. And you know, they did that and they asked me whether or not I would partake and do the beautiful words. And I said, yes, I would. And you saw the spirit. The, uh, <laughs> the spirit was incredible. And when that came out, it went to the number one song. It was beating everybody. It beat uh, Taylor Swift. It beat Molly Cyrus, who was number one and two. They were number one and two. We knocked them off for a long time. That song was out there for there. a long time. Then, of course, yeah, they had so, a problem oh, with Okay, so, I mean, this is the guy that couldn't identify Alexander Hamilton in the lineup, but he, but he, but he knows Taylor Swift and Miley uh-huh. Cyrus. Look, I mean, here's the thing. Um I don't know whether you've read uh, Jonathan Carl has has a new book coming out and it's excerpted in uh, in the Atlantic and um, and he talks about that first rally where where Donald Trump goes down to Waco the 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 scene mm-hmm. of the Branch Davidian anti government um, fiat fiasco and he gives this speech and afterwards uh, he asked Steve Bannon well was this a coincidence that you're down in Waco and Bannon is like strutting and saying yeah we're all Trump Davidians now and that was the first time that he rolled out this anthem from the January 6th protesters. I mean, Tim, do I have to remind people, we're talking about people who attacked the Capitol, who beat up cops, who tried to overthrow the government. They, their crimes were so serious that they are locked up in jail. Donald Trump is not just saying, I think they're being treated unfairly. He's actually promoting their song and referring to them and this is where the stuff where, you know, I hope you just didn't have breakfast or lunch or yeah. dinner. Hostages. Not pre- there, there, by the way, are real hostages in the world, in Gaza, in Israel. This guy, this is referring to Fucker. the people who, yeah, beating up the cops, not as prisoners, but as hostages. You know what he's going to, he's going to, he's going to pardon them, isn't he? He's going to pardon them all. Yeah. Oh, of course he'd pardon them. I don't. You know, the hostages thing, uh, this is pretty obvious on the nose, but it's just worth saying explicitly, like he's doing this to parallel Biden and the Democrats to Hamas, right? Like that's, that's what that's what he's doing, right? He's like Biden and the Democrats are holding these, these people uh, hostages, it, like they are Hamas and, you know, the January Sixers are the, the innocent Israelis who were um, terrorized uh, by Hamas. And so and it, it is, you, I know you didn't, you're trying to make this family podcast now, but um, yeah. it is, fucking, it is like, it, like it is, there's nothing else to do except for to cuss at it. Um, he's a piece of shit. 
And, and, you know, he picked up the endorsement of Rick Scott this week on yeah. the heels of this, right? Like that, like there is no, you know, there was a lot of highfalutin rhetoric, um, from some of these guys like Mitch McConnell after January 6th, you know, even yeah. the ones that didn't vote to convict and, and these people are absent and they, they want to pretend like this isn't happening. They're doing the ostage strategy head in the ground, yep. pretend like Donald Trump doesn't exist. He exists on this other plane of existence. He has his own social media feed. He has his own media network that people watch these things, RBSN and Bannon's podcast, right? Like there's this whole alternate world over here that the yeah. re that not everybody, but much of the Republican Party wants to just pretend like doesn't exist. And, and, and the stuff that's happening in that other world is deeply scary. It's deeply radicalizing. And that's why I don't, you know, we've been doing uh, some some midweek YouTube videos. If you guys miss us during on yeah. Friday, but it was something that I was talking about this week on YouTube. It's just like, I, the media has to talk about this. It is, yes. and, and everyone's tired about it. We're tired. Yes. You're tired. I'm tired. Everyone's right. tired. I get it. But 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 he's out there. He, he's out there glorifying um, uh, uh, insurrectionist prisoners. And, and, and in addition to all of his like weird gaffes that he's been making, confusing World War Two and, yeah. and and confusing yeah. Obama with Biden and all this stuff. And it's just that nobody talks about it. It's not on the nightly news of Lester Holt. Yeah. It's not on the Daily Show. It's right. on MS, right? It's on certain places. But but because I, the news is about I, something that's new, right? And all of the crazy right. is not new. We've been dealing with the crazy. Right. The fact it's that he's like, a seditionist. The fact that he's all of this stuff. Come on, we've reported that. Like, wait, maybe the standard for news shouldn't be just novelty. It should be. <laughs> he's actually a an insurrectionist yeah. who's talking I mean, about imagine? suspending the Constitution. Yeah, could you imagine if like other people like what are the equivalents to this? Some pro crypto candidate does sings a song to SBF or Joe Biden yeah. sings a song to the NT, you know, Jesse Smollett song. Like yeah. like you know, you know, to have prisoner like, like if any other politician was out there doing a sing along with people who are in prison yeah. Yeah. for Law attacking order. cops. Yeah. Back the blue. I, it would be Yes. Yeah. Back of blue. That's the real law and order yeah. candidate. It, it, but it would be wall to wall. But but he gets treated differently and, and he and he shouldn't be. And, and to be honest, this is like on par with as the top of the most outrageous shit he's ever done. And, yeah, I, and yet I, I people totally have done, you know. OK, so you've 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 reaffirmed it for the people who say I, I'm so sick of hearing his voice. OK, there's another little dazzling detail in Jonathan Carl's new, new book. Yeah. Um, that he got from that he got from Steve Bannon. I mean, it's very clear that one of the themes of the Trump campaign, if it's if, if it's not the only theme of the Trump campaign is I am your retribution. Right. right this is the sure. revenge campaign. You know, I'm going to do to you what you did to me and all of this. Um, and so any he uh, he un really unveiled that that retribution theme during that weird Waco rally where he was singing with the January 6th insurrectionist. So Jonathan Carl talks about. And I, I excerpt, this is in the Atlantic, but I excerpted it in my morning shots. Uh, Jonathan Carl goes up to Steve Bannon afterwards, and he's talking about, um, you know, this, this speech. He writes, when I spoke with Bannon a few days later, he wouldn't stop touting Trump's performance, referring to it as his come retribution speech. <laughs> what I didn't realize was that come the phrase come, come retribution, that's the phrase, come retribution. That's the, the phrase that Bannon uses. Yeah. Carl writes, what I didn't realize I, was. Is, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt and be a child, but I just hearing the word ban and next to come retribution is just making me uncomfortable. But okay, let's continue. You, I'm sorry. You're, you're going to hear it continue. several times here. Okay. So you, but you know what that, where that comes from? Well, you know where it comes from? According to historians, come retribution was the code word the Confederate Secret Service used for the plot to take hostage and eventually assassinate Abraham Lincoln. The use of the key phrase come retribution suggests the Confederate co government had made a bitter decision to repay some of the misery that had been inflicted on the, the uh, on the South. Historians write bitterness may well have been directed toward persons held to be particularly responsible for that misery. And Abraham Lincoln certainly headed the list. And then Carl writes Bannon actually okay, in case you're wondering, well, OK, but Bannon didn't mean that when he kept using come retribution. Carl writes. Steve Bannon actually recommended that I read that book, erasing any doubt that he was intentionally using. This is like, I feel like it's like, come on, how, how far do we push it? That he was intentionally using the Confederate code words to describe Trump's speech. And I think Carl writes, puts this in context. So Trump's speech was not an overt call for the assassination of his political oh. opponents, but it did advocate their destruction by other means. Success is, quote, within our reach but only if we have the courage to complete the job, gut the deep state, reclaim our demo 
reclaim our democracy and banish the tyrants and Marxists into political exile forever, Trump declared. This is the turning point. Come retribution. I know. <sighs> This is not I a can't gap. imagine any punishment worse than being a victim of <laughs> Steve Bannon's come retribution. But um, yeah. I, boy, I look, it's a... Got to move on um, from that, Tim. I, yeah, the virtual <laughs> image is tough for me, but yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm trying to, yeah. I'm doing my best. Yeah. Um, the, look, I, I think that the underlying thing here, I mean, Bannon is so just, what a, you know, with all of his like historical, you know, self-important references, you know, some of the stuff is over the top. But I, I, I think that the important element to this is that like, you don't have to have read the 1988 book <laughs> about Confederate retribution to get the message if you're a rank and file MAGA person, yeah. right? Yeah. If you're a MAGA that is radicalized yeah. and you are listening to Donald Trump sing with prisoners, you know, about how he is going, about how they are hostages and how he's going to let them free once he takes over. And we've done this on this podcast before, but yeah, yeah. like it's not a long step. Uh, logically, especially for somebody who's a little bit, you know, has got a screw loose and has got a lot of weaponry. It's not a, it's not a far logical step to think, okay, well, I can go okay, take well, my and retribution again, and, and this guy will take care of me on the back well, end when he wins. Right. Well, and this is what Carl is writing about. Um, and it, it turns out that Jonathan Carl wrote a book about the Branch Davidian um, siege and assault back in the 1990s and how this became the theme for the right. This was government overreach. Um, you know, yeah. 50 people died uh, as a result of all of this. Uh, Timothy McVeigh used what happened in Waco, Texas with the Branch Davidians um, as as one of the pretexts for blowing up the Oklahoma City Federal Building, one of, one of the worst domestic terrorist attacks ever. He did it on the date of that, that particular attack. So this is not a random yeah. moment. This is reaching back into sort of oh, yeah. this, this visceral anti-government, we're at war with the government motif. And Carl's entire point is that this is not, again, this was not unintentional. That's why Steve Bannon says we're Trump Davidians. The implications yeah. of that are, are actually a little hard, even for us, I think it's a little hard to get your head around because yeah. it is the this, because you can't talk about this and separate it from violence, retribution, right. and certain violence. People- yeah. hear that key right in their ear right if, they, if they're schooled in this stuff you know i don't know if you ever read um a very popular memoir is uh, educated about this woman who's like Mormon family uh, whose parent, her father was radicalized right and she's living out in i've yeah. been a while since i read it i think idaho um and uh and but the the guy the people that are on these message boards that are on the fortune that are yeah. listening to this stuff that have read about the branch davidians that have read about mcveigh that have read about all you know all of the one-off you know, uh, uh, folks out in Montana and Idaho, you know, that were that that had other little smaller government skirmishes. I like they they are they're picking up what you're putting down on this imagery, and um and it's not subtle, right, no. at all. And no. and so like that is no points at the heart of the threat. And there's no one again. There's no one in that world that is speaking out. About Right. Like, like there's nobody that, that has any trust with that group that's like, you know, that is offering a that is trying to turn down the temperature. The opposite. Well, and it, it, it's hard to imagine who that would be. I mean, we've seen people from, you know, those worlds speak out against it and it doesn't make any difference. OK, so, right. you know, it's interesting because I, I, I wanted to dive deep into the craziness that's going on in the rest of our uh-huh. politics. But, you know, putting it in this context, the, the problem of talking about the craziness in the House of Representatives or the Senate um, or any place else is that everything is under this cloud of the craziness of Donald Trump. And and so nothing mm-hmm. really right. You know, there is that the alpha craziness that kind of smothers all the others. So yeah. we can talk about, hey, isn't it crazy what's going on in the House? Well, yeah, but you just got done talking about the former president of the United States, who is the, you know, alpha male apex predator of the Republican Party. But let's do it anyway. OK, yeah, okay. this Mike Johnson thing yeah. gets more interesting all the time. Um, I don't think we need to go through the, you know, the, the all the, uh, you know, the, the fifth steps. string choice and all of this. Yeah. I still think it's extraordinary that uh, every single Republican voted for him, despite his record. Yeah. Um I don't know about you. I had to Google him. I never heard of the guy before. Um, he's never I been vetted. Just, I just a really brief anecdote for you. This. The yeah. only reason I'd heard of him because he's relatively new, even here in Louisiana. But yeah. when, when I wrote people, you know, go back. I wrote about, and I don't think I even included this in there, but it was an observation I had. I went to the Louisiana Republican Convention 
Oh, yeah. And, and he piqued my interest there because, uh, you know, as I wrote in the article, the crowd is insane. I mean, you yeah. know, you can still go sometimes to mm-hmm. some Republican events. I just think it's important for, you know, liberal listeners, right, to distinguish. Like, you can go to Republican Party functions, and it still kind of feels like the old days sometimes. Just like, it's the gray hairs, it's the same party chairs, and they like Trump now, so yeah. they've gotten a little weirder. But, like, yeah. but the general feel is the same. That was not true in Latvia. The crowd was crazy. Like, they were super Trumpy. And, and you know, the, they were only cheering for the most insane things, the election mm. fraud, the vaccines, all the conspiracy stuff. I, I, and then Mike Johnson goes to speak. And and he, we've all seen him speak by now. This little kind of howdy doody, kind of like Mr. Yeah. Rogers milk drinking yeah. vibe. Yes, yeah. right. And non people are really into it. You know, and some of the, like Bill Cassidy's getting booed there. Yeah. You know, and so it's, and people are into it. And, and he's using very, you know, obviously very religious language and iconography. He's also using, um, MAGA very comfortably speaking in you know kind of MAGA election fraud stuff but then he also talks about like you know random swamp maintenance or whatever you know like a couple of like logistical things of actual yeah. governance and and people are, are into it and and people were very positive and I watched that and I was like man this guy is like exemplifies this sort of MAGA establishment thing where he's been able to blend you know, at least coming off as someone that can handle basic competent stuff, unlike Louis Gomert, while also being, right. you know, very radical in his rhetoric. And, and so and I just kind of filed that away. And so when his name popped up again on that list on Monday, I was like, huh, I, I you know, I did. I, I it's not like I predicted yeah. him coming, but I, I, you, I sensed that he had, you know, it's been tough to find people that can do that bridge, you know, and he's bridged it for now. We'll see how long for, he can, for, for, he can for, make for now. hold the bridge. Well, I mean, you usually you have a chance for people to get to know who you are before you become second in line to the presidency. Sure. Now, yeah, now it's been speaking. it's been reversed. So it occurs to me that <laughs> one one of the things we've talked about and both of us have written about is 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 the, is the danger that when you keep saying, "Hey, these guys are wackadoodle extremists, Christian nationalists," yeah. I mean, the crazies are in charge. The problem with that is when a real extremist a really guy way out there comes into power and you say, wait, you understand this guy's way out of the mainstream that a lot of, including our listeners will go, well, yeah, I mean, they're all like that, but, but wait, wait, this guy, Mike Johnson, I mean, not only was he a full throated election denialist, he actually wanted to get his colleagues to sign onto that letter asking the Supreme court to throw out tens of millions of votes. So, I mean, this is at the far edge. Okay. Others went along with that. We're now finding out that this is a guy and I am not mocking his Christian faith. I am specifically talking about the specific brand and taste of it, where he apparently thinks there was no such thing as evolution, that men and dinosaurs um, were, um, you know, coterminous. They Living were around together. at the same time. The earth is 6,000 years old. He is into the most extreme anti-gay ideology out there. He believes the Roman Empire fell because of homosexuality. He's been involved in Todd, we can transition do everything, to, Charlie. I mean, we, it's, we it so keeps much going power on. The gays. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Well, Take I mean, I, 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 it's one thing, you know, to talk about because we've had these debates about, well, you know, the, you know, people, there's a lot of hate and there's a lot of anti-gay sentiment and everything. But it's like, wait, now this the real guy has come rolling into the room. And it's like, yeah. have we shot all of our all the rhetoric about no, you understand this guy is like really, really from the the wooliest part of the fever swamps to mix my metaphors. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't think we have. I think that it is important to talk about this distinction and the difference. Um, and, and I think that, look, there is reason for liberals who, who to look at the Republicans and think they're all, they all like that because they've all gone along with it. Right. And, and, and just because, and, and in some ways, right, what you go along with is who you are. Right. In other ways, it is different, right? Like, what what are the going to be things that motivate him? What are going to be things that put him forward? Are, are are people going to be able to to slow down, you know, his more extreme views? Maybe, but we haven't heard a lot of people speaking out about it. I, you know, it is nope. pretty it's pretty telling about the the nature of the Republican conference that Tom Emmer, who voted for that gay marriage compromise bill, th- yeah. there was one Republican congressman who specifically said from Georgia, like on the guy's name, but he's a Republican from Georgia. He specifically said. That I cannot vote for this guy because he supported gay marriage. He's got to get right with God before he can be the Speaker of the House. Okay, so that so so that was you know a deal breaker for somebody that the, the time ever is for gay marriage. Mike Johnson 
thinking that gay sex should be illegal is, yeah. was not a deal breaker for anybody. Now, some of them might say it all. Oh, I disagree with them on that or we disagree. Right, right, but it wasn't a deal. It wasn't any, nobody was like, hey. And I, I do think that's telling about the nature of, of where the conference is, where the power is within the conference. And, and um, there's just no pushback on this. I mean, it, it would have been easier to define Johnson, I think, in the pre-Trump era. Because he just fits right in, in the mold of a Santorum, of a Ken Cuccinelli, of an Alan Keyes, right? Like a Bauer, Gary Bauer, like a far, like, like, you know, at the far mm. edge of the religious Rick, Rick, right. Rick and Santorum is Mitt Romney compared to this guy. Right now, I mean, right? Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. In the pre Trump era, it would have been easy to fight him because he would, that yeah. would have been his brand, right? I would have been the yeah. most extreme yeah, Christian right. conservative. Okay. But now right. he's gone along with all the Trumpy stuff. That's what I, that's what I say. So now oh, we're okay. adding right. that on top of it. Um, anyway, um, and, and, and I think that's like, that is a little bit harder for people to wrap their heads around. All right. I, all right. So I guess that's my point. The, I, I, I don't underestimate just the, the power of exhaustion that the reason why everybody rolled over was they were just tired yeah. of not having a speaker. They were embarrassed. Uh, it was the real prospect that they might have to cut a deal with Democrats. And at a certain point, everybody just threw up their hands, but it is amazing um, and I want to get your take on this because you are our, our, our whisperer in all of this, even the, the Ken Bucks of the world. I mean, there, there was like five minutes there. Do you remember this? This The five yeah. minutes where it looked like the moderates or the quote unquote moderates or the, the yeah. normies were, were going to draw the line. They weren't going to go along with Jim Jordan. They stood up against Donald Trump. They stood up against the threats. It seemed like there were antibodies. And then they all rolled over. Not one yeah. of them voted against this guy. So was it all? Is it all exhaustion or what else does it tell you? What was this? Yeah, exhaustion is part of it. Um, I, Ken Buck, I think, I, I, I don't know that I can be your Ken Buck whisperer. I think he needs to see a psychiatrist. I, it seems to me that he has got going through some things personally. Okay, just, just I, remind people, because, I mean, this was the guy who's saying that we can, he was, the, his standard was you cannot be an election denialist. I will not vote for you if you do not acknowledge that Joe Biden won the election. So he votes against Steve Scalise. I think he voted against Tom Emmer. I don't, no, no, I don't know who he voted. No, no he voted. But, we, but he was we, very, we, very we clear. voted against Jordan. But then he does, yeah. then he gets to do the cable news rounds. He's on CNN. He's on yeah, MSNBC. All, all the time. Talking principles. And, yeah. and, he, and he's on the way out. So, I mean, he, then he announces yeah. this, this last week that he's retiring Retire. because yeah. he's so sick and tired of the Republicans embracing election nihilism. Uh, this a couple of days after he votes for this full throated election denialist. So Ken Buck is on the way out. He doesn't have a career to, to save necessarily. Right. He's, he's headed to cable news commentary. And yet the last important thing he does is to vote for Mike Johnson. Explain this yeah, to I me. Mean, peer pressure <laughs> and peer pressure and psych and, and psych psychiatric requirements, I think, is my assessment of Ken, Ken Buck. Okay. The rest of them, uh, here's what I really think. I, I think that it's important to really understand the House conference as a, as a, as a high school cafeteria. I, I, and, and, I, and, and these are, gr okay. uh, uh, these are, these are grown children yeah. who need attention. And uh, we, we, I don't know if you saw the they don't want to sit alone. Nancy Mesa's staff. Yeah, they don't want to sit alone at the lunch table. We even heard from Romney. You had a great interview with McKay Coppins yesterday. But like, even for somebody like Romney, you know, sitting alone is to, it wears on you, right? Like, and, and, and if you, you don't want to, nobody wants to be the outcast. Okay, anyway. And I, so I think that what we, so that's one element of the cafeteria. The other element is these guys really hated Jim Jordan. Like at a very personal level, right? Uh, Jim Jordan had screwed well them merited. over for hard, years. Hard yeah, well merited, yeah. you well heard. For years, he had screwed them over. He had, you know, gotten in front of the TV cameras and pulled the rug out from under them, and he pretended to be, you know, more right wing. And they were sick of him. And I think that despite the fact that Mike Johnson and Jim Jordan are pretty much indistinguishable policy wise, Mike hasn't been around long enough to grind any of these people's gears. And so they just did what they've gotten accustomed to doing, which is just folding to the real power center of the party, which is the MAGA right. And, and so I, that's how I assess it. Some of it was they were embarrassed and tired, but others of it was the Jim Jordan thing wasn't actually based on principle. They used the rhetoric of principle, but it was they really more based guts. on personal animus. Yeah. 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 
Okay, so I want to move on from from uh, Mike Johnson in just in just okay. a moment. You know, I actually had to stop myself. Okay, is it Mike Johnson? Is it Mike Jones? Yeah. Because I, I haven't gotten quite used to it. I but to, I mean, I had to I had to save uh, who was it? so I had to save Nicole on live TV the other day. She was just like, and she looks at me and she just spaces out and she's like, "What's his name again?" And I was like, uh, "You know, I, <laughs> I I I do not judge anyone on all of this." <laughs> okay, so his first his first big thing, of course, is uh, to link uh israel aid to this uh slash an irs which was of course you know a big maga talking point that we you know have to roll back joe biden's um in- enforcement measures kind of blew up in his face when the cbo comes back and says yeah that's not actually going to save any money it's going to actually yeah. add to the deficit he goes ahead with it the house did <laughs> pass it he got the votes including democrats I'm it's so, DOA. Sorry, do we need to just really quick do we need to go to the to the cbo on this i mean it's like yeah. hey well, what we're going to do is we're going to yeah. stop collecting taxes from tax cheats. Do we think yeah. that that's going to give us more revenue or less? Like it doesn't it didn't really take a macro economist to figure that one out. But hey, I'm sorry. Continue. So so I think that's dumb politics. Um, well, how, how bad a mistake was it? He he did get the votes. He did get it through the House. I was DOA. It's not going to go anywhere in, in the yeah. Senate. But it turned out, I think, not to be the talking point he was hoping is an indication that you know, here's a guy who has been thrust into a job that perhaps he doesn't fully grasp. Yeah, he bought himself some time with it, I guess. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, no, I don't think it's good talk. But he brought a new comms director, former mm. colleague of mine, Raj Shah, uh, who was uh, who oh went from goodness, the Trump really? White House to Fox. And at Fox, he was he was the mastermind behind helping them navigate the post-election fraud hysteria and dominion yeah. work and how to deal that with oh, how well they were them doing. yeah oh yeah a lot of emails from him you saw in the dominion lawsuit about how they're getting their ass handed to them by the by newsmax and stuff and they need to do better to accommodate the base that really worked out well so raj was just one of the many people that cost the rupert murdoch family almost 800 million dollars and and mike johnson looked at him and he's like you're my man for talking points so i i don't know that they're they've got the best and the brightest working over there as far as talking points are concerned how do, how do you think that happened um, by the way but, wait 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 how, how did it happen you know you would think that you know on earth 2.0 guy like that like like yeah. that would be kind of discredited radioactive did the trump world folks call him up and say this is the guy we want we want him to be your comms director because yeah. well some somebody must have been his rabbi yeah, I p- partially probably, uh, and and maybe Fox. I don't know. Who knows? Maybe Mike. You know, all these guys have build relationships with Fox because they want to get on TV, right? Um, mm-hmm. So I I don't exactly know who his rabbi was. I'll tell you this though: the um the binder full of resumes for comms people on the Hill on the Republican side is pretty light. Yeah. Um. You know, I'll, I'll, do you have your? We've had on uh, on you know this uh, podcast before. Brent, my friend Brendan Buck, who's on MS. Yeah. You know, he used to his Paul Ryan's guy. You know, in a different world. Right. You bring on somebody like that in a more senior role and they bring on some younger people who are competent, who are, you know, up and come, you know, right to to actually do the day to day. Those people don't want this job. Right. Like. And and so so the pool you're picking from are Jim Jordan are are like MAGA comms people or, you know, you go to somebody like Raj who who doesn't have shape. So I I think that's what happens. He's got got an eight hundred million dollar defamation thing on his resume. (laughs) Lost. Well, I mean, it's not just yeah, on his resume. It was many, many hosts. I, I think yeah. it's easy for Raj to go there and be like, "Sorry, yeah. it's Mr. Speaker. It was not my fault. That was Maria Barrett Romo's fault." Anyway, okay. Point being, I, I don't think it's the best and the brightest over there, and I, I don't think that the best and the brightest are applying. Um, and, but I, I think the thing that he has going for him is that I, at the far who who also the Jim Jordan's already been rejected. There, there isn't any unless Matt Gates wants this job for himself. There's nobody like to his MAGA right, you know, who who could take it. And we've already just finished discussing how the moderates aren't going to throw him over. So I think that as long as he continues to kind of hold the hard line edge on this stuff, um, he's going to be he's going to be fine within the conference. Now, push is going to come right, yeah. to shove yeah. on the budget eventually. And, and so my guess is that, you know, he'll he'll get a he'll get a pass. Kevin McCarthy got a pass twice before they threw him yeah. over. You know, to cut the deals necessary to keep the government open, but um, you know he's a uh, yeah. he's he's in over his head. There's no doubt about. It. Well, I mean, uh, you know, I had Adam Kinzinger on the other day, and he, he was describing the the dynamic in a similar way. Is that the you're sitting around the room, and the person, um, and everybody's holding a hand grenade. Uh, the, the most powerful person in the room is the one who's willing to pull the the pin on the hand grenade. You know, Matt Gates was willing to pull the pin, as you pointed out down in New Orleans. Tom Emmer is not going to be the guy to pull the pin. Um, on on him. But the other pro- problem, though, 
is that it's not just Mike Johnson, is the fact that his caucus is still completely f***ed up. I mean, the dysfunction uh, was a pre-existing condition. But just like in the last couple of days, and you did a, a great YouTube short on all of this, you have this, 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 you know, slap fight going on with Marjorie Taylor Greene and Chip Roy. I mean, if you had to take, you know, a couple of people that, from the far edges of the right of this caucus, these people hate each other. There is so much yeah. personal bitterness. I mean, they're going back and forth. You have Marjorie Taylor Greene tweeting about, what did she say about wow. Lauren Boebert? I mean, so Marjorie Taylor Greene hates groper. Lauren Boebert. I mean, this is this is what's um, this is what's amazing about these personal animus is that it's not about issues, it's not about principle. But when you have oh. that kind of a volatile situation, don't be surprised when things just blow up over some unpredictable, shit, right? Yeah, there's the old Simpsons gag from like the '90s uh, where it was like the Democratic convention and it said, "We hate ourselves, we can't govern." Were the signs, and it's like the that is just the republicans have just totally embraced that ethos right uh, uh, that they they do not like each other and they are not capable of governing uh, the mike jo and, and yeah. so they, they were That's barely the capable of choosing a team captain i mean like think about this it took them a month to choose a team captain like that's that's where they are they finally chose one and now the you know captain's got to make decisions and all of those are going to be a cluster these people do not like each other uh, they're blocking each other on Twitter. Nancy Mace and, and another guy uh, like from North Carolina, Murphy, Greg Murphy. Uh, she called him a pussy. He blocked her on Twitter. Uh, MTG, I do got to give her credit. She called Chip Roy Colonel Sanders. I thought that was a good hit. Um, but I, or, or, what is or, or, I, this or, or, is yeah. Yeah. yeah These are hard to watch. I mean, when, when she refers to um, CNN wannabe Ken Buck, she doesn't care about that. And but, vaping, groping Lauren Boebert. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a deep cut. So and then uh, Chip Roy not, says, "Why don't you go chase the Jewish space lasers?" I mean, how do you walk back from that? Shit, you know, yeah, this is not happening on the other side. So, uh, so look, these people are children. It's a cafeteria, and, and again, who are doing these tweets? This goes this goes back to the question of like, can Mike Johnson put this together? Can he come up with good talking points? I, I just just I, I just want to shout out this. Like you mentioned, Kinsinger, Kinsinger's old comms person, Laura Gillespie, awesome. Cheney's yeah. comms guy, a guy named Jerry Adler. Both these people are out. Right. Like, who are you recruiting from? You're recruiting yeah. from the people that have decided I want to go work for Marjorie Taylor Greene and Chip Roy and Nancy Mace while they call each other names and, and fight over who, what, you know, can suckle on Donald Trump's toes the hardest. Right. Like the types of people that sign up for those jobs are a certain brand of person. And, and, and like they are not people to play well together in a group. Um, you know, they're not people that care deeply about policy and, and helping the country. And so this is what you're going to get. I, I just had a flash of of like a group therapy session with Marjorie Taylor <laughs> Greene, Lauren Boebert, Nancy Mace, because they're all going through something, right? I mean, they're going through some stuff, and I don't think you can analyze it on a political level. You, this is there's some psychological stuff going on here. Yeah. And by about, the way, I don't mean to pick on just one women. Flew over the cuckoo's nest, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Yeah. maybe. Um, had, who's we, Jack we, Nicholson here? I don't know. Matt Gates, uh, maybe. All right, we have we have so much else to talk about here, in, <laughs> including sp speaking of um, interesting back and forths. Uh, I am I am way not interested in the whole Dean Phillips uh, primary challenge to Joe Judge, Biden. I'm, yeah. I, I, I am I am sorry, but there's only one element in, that I'm interested in. <laughs> okay, you were in Fuego on this, and I want to let you go on on this because because uh, Dean Phillips himself poses no threat to Joe Biden. He's he's going to get like seven percent of the vote in some places. I don't know. It's just it's it's not going to happen. But there is that little twist. Our old friend Steve Schmidt of. I mean, what do we? How do we describe Steve Schmidt? You know, big big McCain oh. guy, guy who gave yeah. America Sarah Palin, was on MSNBC yep. with both you and me. Big yep. guy in the Lincoln Project until things blew blew uh, blew up in a rather spectacular yep. fashion. He who is, Howard who's Schultz. The guy? Don't forget the how, okay. big man, for, the main man for Howard you, Schultz. Okay, so you bailed me out on that one. You know, <laughs> here here's one about how deep a dive you want to go. Remember when Howard Schultz was running for president? No. Yeah. Um. But uh, Steve Schmidt remembers because he got a lot of yeah. money from Howard Schultz, right? A lot. A lot. His, you know, and the I Starbucks. Thought, so this is the thing. Stuff. Nothing pisses me off more than bad strategy and just like and, – and over overt self recall hurts in defense of yeah. bad strategy. And, and like as a former political professional, I still have some, you know, trade craft that I, that I have some respect for. People that don't want to do things the right way. 
And, and this Dean Phillips thing is just doing it such the wrong way in the most grifty and obnoxious way possible. And that's the thing that pissed me off about it. Not because I'm, I'm like you. I'm not really yeah. worried. It's a big threat to Joe Biden. Frankly, I've been in the Bill Crystal camp for like, not recently really, but but for a long time I was and thought maybe it'd be good for Joe Biden to have somebody that ran a good yeah. faith campaign against him that was not trying to undermine him, that yeah. was not being the turn the punch bowl, but was just offering voters a generational change option yeah. that's right. much in the Joe Biden mold. I, I yeah. would have told you that the scene would that happen. I think that yeah. probably wouldn't have worked. But uh, you know, you need you need a magic, you know, the the right the white whale to do that. Probably the non white whale really to do yeah. that. But but anyway, I would have been open to that. This is not that. This is a uh, just I, I think you know all about ego mania, and it is an effort that maybe they maybe Dean Phillips. I don't think Steve Schmidt. Maybe Dean Phillips intends this to be a good faith effort, but it is not. Like the actual actions of it are only going to serve to harm joe biden luckily i think they're going to be so incompetent that it won't actually do anything to harm joe biden in the end but but running a campaign at this late of a date where your message is that is that joe biden has dementia and that the and that everything costs too much like that is that's not a helpful message to joe biden and and when joe biden is our first line of defense against the man we were just talking about earlier singing about insurrectionists then like maybe let's not healthy criticism helpful criticism, you know, helpful efforts, you know, to, to say, Hey, here's something you could do better. Joe Biden. Sure. But, but trying to undermine him uh, for, for no reason, except your own egomania is crazy. And, and the last thing on this, just, I got called by Howard Schultz. I didn't get called by Dean Phillips, but if I did get called, I would have said the same thing to both of them, which is a, I am not going to do anything that will help Donald Trump period. End of story. Number two, if you have a third party or Democratic primary effort that you think might actually help the effort to defeat Donald Trump, I'm happy to give you some free advice on that. But you need to go find a f-ing Democrat <laughs> to, to mm. help you do it, right? Like you do not need a former Republican as the front man about this. I, I and 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 I've had calls from other uh, other folks. Like that is that is just that is just the only like logical advice that somebody in in steve yeah. schmidt's shoes should be able to give that is not what they did instead steve schmidt's out there giving press conferences for dean phillips that, that he's claiming to tim alberta that they're going to attack joe biden every day yeah I, I think it's luckily it seems like it's incompetent and they haven't got off the launching pad but it's super dangerous and i think that you know i felt like it was my role to just wave the flag and be like guys this is a grift let's not let, let's not do anything to get sucked up into this in a way I, that I, might I, help I, donald trump I, I, I agree with almost all of that. However, on the other hand, I, I do think, you know, that in a democracy, um, you know, the more sure. the merrier you get in, you make the case. It'll be um, a uh, low pressure test, I think, for Joe Biden. He's going to have to deal with those issues. Um, this will be a way of, you know, maybe tuning up the engine. Uh, Dean Phillips is not going anywhere. But, you know, in a democratic society, uh, we, we you know, run in. But, okay. but, but, but there is the, you know, the... We don't have time to get into it, but I mean, there, there, there are all the mixed motivations of the people who ought to be more right. behind the scenes. Let me put it that way. Okay, so you had a very, yeah. very hey, interesting just, piece. Just, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just really yeah. quick, one yeah. sentence. I agree with that. I'm just saying, don't tell me you're trying to save democracy when you're actually harming the guy that's at the first well, okay. front all line right. defending democracy. That's my only point. Don't piss on me no. and tell me it's raining. Okay, yeah, if you want to okay. get so, in the race, go. Uh, for let's it. talk about you. You I, have I just, written I don't about like um, these elections that are coming up that I think are not on most people's radar screen. Um, including the, I mean, how, how real is, are, is, is, is the possibility that you have this Democrat, Brandon Presley, who might win in, in Mississippi? I, I think the Kentucky race is more realistic. Um, and the is sitting governor is interesting race. Andy Bashir, he's winning in the polls, Democrat. Uh, I th- and, and he is, he does, you know, done a lot of the same, same things as Presley, but he, there's been a lot of coverage of him. Yeah. So I was, I was interested in the Presley race. Um, yeah. You know, cause Mississippi's even redder than, than Kentucky. Yeah. Mississippi's still Mississippi. Okay. And, and, you know, and, and so it, I think this could be a situation where the, where there's the math doesn't work out and he comes up short. Like right now, even in the good polls for him, he's at 46 Presley getting from 46 to 50, I think might be hard. You know, but even if he yeah. ends up in a place where 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 the incumbent wins this thing, fifty three yeah. forty seven, there's a lot to learn from that, right? Because there are a lot of other red states that aren't quite as red as Mississippi, and and I think that the Democrats have done a poor job recently of recruiting the types of candidates that appeal 
in these states, you know, that maybe are not perfect on, on down the yeah. line on progressive values. Actually, yeah, they shouldn't is. be, you yeah. know, and, right. And, and I think recruiting, and, and I think that, that, you know, there is a way to come by. I've always said this about, about Georgia. You know, I, there, I have a lot of criticisms of Stacey Abrams, but I do give her credit on the, on the voter reg thing. And I think if you're combining registering voters of color with finding candidates that are heterodox, the, that, that could be a winning formula. And I think that Mississippi, that Presley's okay. done a good job of being heterodox. I, I, I don't know that Mississippi's done as good of a job as they should on the on getting black voters registered. Registra- that might end up being the thing that, that arms them. But anyway, I, I, I find that to be interesting. And as a long-term effort, I think that there's more opportunity there for center centrist candidates to do what Presley's doing in the Democratic Party for right now. Maybe this will change in 10 years. That in the Republican Party, where all the centrist candidates just get slaughtered in these primaries by MAGA candidates, even in blue states, as we've seen with Hogan and uh, and Scott and uh, excuse me and Baker and, and and Massachusetts. So I'm just I'm trying to be constructive and encourage candidates well, the, the, that are this, doing the right thing. Is, this is constructive. Now, by the way, when you say heterodox, um, he takes a lot of positions that are quite socially conservative that would yeah, not true. play anywhere um, uh, out, outside of say you know the. The, the deep south but well that's that's, sure. that's not true but the point you make though is is one of the differences between the parties is the way that the centrists are being wiped out in republican primaries centrists continue to do relatively well in democratic primaries and i actually think that that's going to you know happen going forward i mean uh, i was just looking at the at the numbers of you know for example elon omar barely won her democratic primary last time yeah and that was before a lot of stuff happened um so I think it's are, something to watch. Just I'm glad you mentioned that these squad primaries are going to be yeah. something to watch. And I don't, again, I, yeah. I, I, I'm I, I'm not putting a crystal ball. I'm just saying I, I think that there's that it's it, it is interesting, right? That that Jamal Bowman is getting a primary. I, mm-hmm. I believe Omar is getting another one. I believe Corey Bush is. Uh, and 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 um, uh, I'm missing one. Summer Lee, I think, is getting yeah. a primary. So so uh, this is interesting. We'll see if they all yeah. the face plant. Maybe maybe there's nothing here. But I, I think that at least one difference that we know is there is that it, within the Democratic coalition, the center candidates feel like they got a shot to right. do these primaries, right? Like right. that is not happening. You're not seeing this on the Republican side where like Marjorie Taylor Greene is getting a primary from the center. Like that would be an absurd thing to do. Nobody would think yeah. that person would have a chance. Yeah. Um, no matter how insane she is. Right. And and, and so uh, in, in the Democratic side, there's a feeling that this is that this is possible. We'll see how it works out in practice. But we have seen a lot of primaries. You know, I, I've mentioned this before, but even in San Francisco, the, the recall, you don't want to just rely on this one example. But, yeah. but, you know, there are certain examples out there that you've seen where this has worked within the Democratic coalition because of the nature of the coalition, which includes a lot of older, more conservative voters of color, more moderate, uh, sort of say the wrong word, but more small C conservative. And, uh, and, and now includes a lot more independent suburban types that, that and, have been pra- and, and pragmatists. Has been yeah, pregnant, exactly. as we saw in the yeah. 2020 presidential. Okay, so briefly in the time that we have left, we haven't uh, spent much time uh-huh. on the Republican primary fight, mainly because oh, good. I, I knew I had one I think, more I, I I think we know. Well, okay, I think we know where this is going, but I mean, the storyline of the day, and of course, there has to be a storyline of the day because otherwise, political reporters and pundits get bored, right? Um, is Nikki Haley surging? Tim Miller, is she? I mean, I it can't. looks like she's. It looks like she's picking up endorsements money edging on the polls no indication she's going to beat donald trump but what do you think i just can't why uh, i mean i look we had my I, I, look, I, it's fine to say that haley would be a better candidate that that she's the best hope in a in a really uphill battle I mean, mike murphy had a thing for us where it's like the sanders yes. should drop out because at least haley right. has momentum i don't necessarily disagree with that I, I think maybe me and murph would have a different assessment yeah. of the likelihood of success of that but but i i think that that so i just want to be clear that is not what i'm saying it's fine to try i, I think right. it's always good to be out on the field and try right. Right. and Haley beating trump would obviously be great it's worth trying but but what be bother, better bothers world. me yeah exactly what bothers me is like the horse race industrial complex and that's why i hope people can come to the bulwark for for real <laughs> political analysis here's political playbook today i woke up this morning and i was like am i still dreaming that subject line in my inbox Haley's moment Yep, and then it begins with every four years it happens, a candidate gets some surge of momentum and is treated to a few weeks of the spotlight. For a short period, it feels like they might actually take this top spot, but then there's a crash and burn, and the spotlight inevitably cycles over to one of their competitors. 
I was like, oh, okay, Playbook's finally got it right. This might be something that happens to Haley. Right. And then, but then they go, yet, every once in a while, the momentum sustains and feels real. That's where former Gov Nikki Haley is right now. That seems a little premature. What are you talking about? The the, the examples they gave Herman of the people that didn't sustain, Herman Cain, Newt Gingrich, Rick Perry, Michelle Bachman, all these people got up into the 25, 30% range in national polls. I, like there was real reason for them to have the spotlight. I, I they were winning. This. Herman Cain was winning for a little while in the primary. <laughs> uh, and Nikki Haley isn't winning. She's losing by forty points yeah. to Donald Trump. Even in this, even in this Iowa poll, where where she gained ten points. No, okay, great. She's gained ten points. She's up at sixteen. That's that's worth noting. She's losing to Trump by. I got to do math in my head here. It's so many. I've got to like count on my fingers. Twenty seven, and 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 and, and the DeSantis voters when you ask them what their second choice is more of them like trump than haley so so if you added it's that hard. in haley's down by like 30 points to trump in iowa which should be his weak state so the idea that that, tr- that her momentum the, feels real line, well it's a trend <laughs> tim tim i want you to zoom keep in it's friday you zoom in Can we see the trend line though it's like her, it's a going alive. from here to here i'm i am not look, i'm hope, not a i am not a nikki haley fan fine. i have written about her it's, but but in terms of you look at the field, if if you close your eyes and you hope for a unicorn hard enough, sure. you can imagine that she becomes the old. I mean, DeSantis is just blown up on the launch pad you know, multiple yeah. times. So Did she's you see the his one line right now about wearing a boot on his head. I mean, it's really good. It's getting it's getting really he, bad. He has, he has the best people working for him, right? I mean, you oh can tell gosh. his comms folks, they sat around that room on the whiteboard. What do we say? Okay, we will eat our hat. No. <laughs> Anybody else got any ideas? No, Ron yes. should say, the governor should say, I will put a boot on yeah. my head. Okay, I'm just trying to... Donald I just, Trump debates. I'm trying to reverse Donald engineer Trump. how these ideas, you know. If Donald yeah, Trump shows I think up, I will put a boot like on my come from Casey. I don't, Or maybe Ron himself, he's not that good, but... Yeah, okay, no, I just, I hear you on the unicorn and on the hope. That's why I'm trying to be, that's why it's Politico, though, that that, it, that they are supposed to be offering you insider political news that gives you a peek behind the curtain about what's really happening. And and they're totally wrong. And so it's like, okay, have hope for Nikki Haley. I, I don't want to take anyone's hope away. No. You know, hope, I love people. I love hope. You know, hope dies last. But um, but hope don't will kill you. Don't gaslight so we'll kill you don't fucking look at, don't write me a yeah. memo about how about how nikki haley it has real momentum and newt gingrich didn't newt gingrich almost won that primary uh, so anyway I remember, I remember um, that. I, i'm a no i'm a no on nikki haley momentum from an objective standpoint i'm a yes from fairy's unicorn standpoint if you want to if you want to have a purple drink and dream a little dream about nikki that's cool with me well again I, i'm not a, i'm not a I, I'm not a Nikki fan necessarily. I've written all you. kinds of stuff about her, you know, the lightness and the, you know, the, the incredible lightness of Nikki Haley and the way that she went back and forth. She hadn't, couldn't decide what she Arch. wanted to be. However, if we were to wake up tomorrow in a world in which Nikki Haley was the nominee instead of Donald Trump, <laughs> leaving aside the partisan horse race, it would you be could retire. a fundamentally better world. It yeah. would be so much better. And don't don't DM me about how she put her position on this or position of this. Well, if we didn't have to deal with Donald Trump, but but that's why I keep invoking the unicorn. Right. Because how do you get yeah. to that? You get to you get to unicorn something 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 meteor. Um, Donald Trump dies of right. you know the Big Mac. I could, because I, 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 I don't see how it happens otherwise. I could open a bar. I could start writing about other stuff. You know, I could start ex- exploring new interests. If, if that if that world see, happened, see, um, see Tim, uh, you've just given great. away you've given away a huge secret here. Okay, we, I, I'm not even sure we should publish this because I think people think, oh, you never Trumpers, you love Trump. Trump is you know is is the is the wind beneath your wings, and the and the real the real truth yeah. is that. No, we want to be done, and you know, we, feel like, we, we feel like we feel like we are explore. we are you know chained to this rock, lashed to the mast of all of this. If Donald Trump were to go, 
we could move on into the That's sunny great. uplands of the future of our lives, right? That's great. <laughs> and my little brain, I just, I've, I have areas of my brain that I can't even explore, you know, because they've been locked in, in an orange dungeon for eight years. That is so, so I'm you know what? It. That is exactly, it's so funny you should say that because <laughs> I, I think, so this is our therapy session. It's like, <laughs> just imagine what your life would be like. Maybe that would be the thing to do sometimes to sit around and go, okay, now close your eyes and just mm. imagine. We're not making a prediction, but yeah. what would your life be like if you never had to think or write about Donald Trump? See, the problem is, you know, that's never going to happen. Is, is that is that it's it's never going to be that moment where the sun rises, the, the leaves are green, the birds are chirping, and then and the name Trump will never have to leave your lips again because there's always Eric and Ivanka and Don Jr. <laughs> and and that vast ecosystem the tall out there. ones. Baron. Up. All right. So, yeah, Baron Trump. I, okay. I was hoping to end this, go into the weekend with a little bit of a dollop of hope, but here oh, we are. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm going to go off into my, into my happy place, and I'm going to imagine that, a world without Trump, just for like five minutes. Just think about that. Okay. That sounds good. I, I'll yeah. join you there for five minutes. Then I'm going to distract myself, turn to LSU Alabama this weekend. Go Tigers. Hey, you know what I'm doing tonight? I'm going What's to that? a Milwaukee Bucks game, Bucks versus the Knicks down at Pfizer. Oh, nice. With my French grandson, who this will be his first American basketball game, his first NBA game. So I'm taking That is him huge. Down Tell him to, to send see. me a text. I want an update. Giannis, Dame, he, the little he, pick and roll. Oh, that's going to be good. He's going to be wearing game. a Giannis jersey. Little little French guy that. wearing the Giannis jersey. Okay, Tim, I love we'll talk that. in a couple of weeks. All right. All right we'll and thank you all time. for listening to this weekend's Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We will be back on Monday, and we'll do this all over again. Happy place. Happy place.